from Seattle, Washington, where I am currently staying. Let me adjust the camera ever so slightly. There we go. Hello and good morning. Welcome to the Monday Morning Introduction to Philosophy and Theory livestream. My name is Julian. Today, we're going to be hosting a 45-minute lecture titled, quote, unquote, What is Wrong with Zizek? This is going to be the final lecture in my The Divine Madness series, in which I've tried to stage a deep dive, an in-depth reading of Zizek's engagement with Christianity and theology, and how his arguments apropos God in pain or so-called Christian atheism relate back to his ontological system, as it were. What I'm going to be doing in this next video, this lecture, is to examine some of the criticisms made apropos Zizek and how he responds to them, how we might be able to articulate Zizek's philosophy, um, and specifically to engage with the question whether or not Zizek is a quote-unquote legitimate philosopher. Uh, so this is going to be a video, if you will, in defense of Slavoj Zizek, and a sort of final lecture in this series on why Zizek is worth reading and studying and taking seriously. If you're new here, my name is Julian. I used to work as an educator at the University of Oxford Brooks. During the pandemic, I began live streaming open access lectures for anybody to join. My goal was to make philosophy and theory, specifically continental philosophy and critical theory, more accessible to people around the world. And since then, we've built this lovely global community of people who enjoy learning and studying and reading together. Uh, so on behalf of everybody who's helped me do this, especially our patrons who continue to generously finance this open access project, I want to say a huge thank you. For the past two and a half years, I've been starting every week, every Monday morning with this incredibly enriching and intellectually invigorating session, at least for me. For me, it is. So I just want to say thank you for having received that opportunity. I'm so grateful to you guys. And I really hope that we can continue this because it gives me a lot of joy. And I hope that it helps you as well in your own studies. That is my hope, at least. I see some people joining us from Indonesia, Romania. Please do drop a comment letting me know where you're joining us from. That gives me very, very much satisfaction. Cambodia, hello. Peru, that's incredible. Such nice places, so much nicer than a cold Seattle morning. Although we've had really nice weather here. Turkey, good morning, Turkey, Marava, Lebanon. Um, that's incredible. Thank you guys so, so much. Uh, I see the usual comments about my hair. Yes, uh, I, I, I've addressed this before. I have crazy hair. There's nothing I can do about it. I've, this is just what my hair does. And um, it is, I can assure you, it is washed. Uh, and and uh, I apologize in advance for everyone who takes objection to my hair. Um, this is just how it is. <laughs> a Dr. Seuss hair, if you will. And, and I, yes, I have tried to wrestle it into control. It's just very lively. Uh, but uh, I hope that you can make your peace with it, as I have as well. Um, okay, on that note, let us jump right in. Oh, I do have one little disclaimer, or a little plug, which is... Um, so... For those of you who are patrons, you probably already know this, but every time I finish a lecture series, so every three months, I release an accompanying ebook that is based on the lectures. Essentially what I do is that I take the edited transcripts for each and every lecture, it tends to be 12 or 13 lectures, um, and my wonderful wife, Jeneline, edits them into transcripts, and those transcripts I then rewrite into an ebook form or version of the lectures, usually about 100 pages or so. And right now, you can download the previous lecture series ebook, namely, um, And Yet It Moves, Five Lessons on Zizek. And that's going to be available on Patreon until the end of the month, after which it will disappear into the digital ether forever and be replaced by the next volume, the next installment, which will be titled The Divine Madness to accompany this lecture series. And so if you haven't had a chance to watch all these videos, which I completely understand, I mean, who has the time to watch 12 one-hour lectures? Uh, please consider becoming a patron. If you join before the end of the month, you'll be able to download both ebooks for the price of one. And it's really the one thing that I monetize about this project because it creates a wonderful sense of having a readership that understands where we're coming from. I don't have to market it. I don't have to create some kind of sales pitch. It is really an ebook that is entirely true to our community and to what these lectures are. 
And above all, I hope that they're helpful, that they are study guides that can assist you in your own learning. I certainly enjoy writing them. And if you'd like to download them, please consider becoming a patron by going to www.patreon.com forward slash Julian philosophy. Okay. Thank you very much. So I had the alternate title that I had for the lecture today was the incontinence of the void, which I think is a lovely description of Zizek's ontology. But then I thought to myself, that would be a little bit hard for people who are just entering into this topic. Um, to, you know, ontology, the void, incontinence, etc. And so my goal is that at the end of this video, hopefully you will understand a little bit better what Zizek means by the incontinence of the void, which we certainly touched upon last week as well. Um, but for I did want to start with the book titled The Incontinence of the Void. And what's interesting about The Incontinence of the Void is that Zizek actually starts by addressing certain criticisms that are raised frequently apropos his persona and his philosophy. And in, in classic sort of political fashion, uh, or, 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 or contrarian to political fashion, I should say, uh, usually politicians are told that they should deny the premise of a question, right? So for example, somebody says, well, aren't you too old to be running for office? And instead of defending yourself by saying, well, no, I'm actually really young, which would therefore simply serve to make you look more old, you deny the premise of the question and you simply start talking about how you want to, I don't know, make more jobs or something like this. That's a classic political evasive, evasive strategy. However, in this case, Zizek takes some of the key criticisms, what is wrong with Zizek, essentially, and instead of trying to simply deny them, he actually affirms those criticisms but reframes the manner in which the criticism is posited. So he almost seems to accept them or to validate them. Call it a philosophical equivalent of Eminem's famous uh, rap battle scene at the end of Eight Mile. Now, what are the three criticisms that are leveled at Zizek most commonly that he addresses in, in the beginning of this book? Well, the first is that Zizek is not a legitimate philosopher. That he does not have a system of philosophy, but simply an interpretive method. And that what Zizek does is to simply jump around from one topic to another, movies, jokes, anecdotes, uh, a little bit of Lac Lacanian psychoanalysis sprinkled upon some Hegelian obscurantism. That, that tends to be sort of the, the criticism. The second criticism is that Zizek's uh, 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 is nothing but a fraud and an entertainer and someone whose many manifold tics, you know, his tugging at his shirt and, and, and scratching his nose and sniffing, betray a kind of deeply rooted insecurity that he knows that he's a fraud and that it's a symptom of his uh, illegitimacy and that he, instead of being a stoic sort of master, is therefore a kind of hysterical, symptomatic charlatan as it were. That would be the, the second criticism. Um, and then I'll get to the third criticism in a moment, but first I want to address those two because they're interconnected to the third one, which I think is quite important. So the first criticism, Zizek is not a legitimate philosopher because he does not have an interpretive, he does not have a system of philosophy, he only has an interpretive method. So Zizek actually, to some extent, endorses this position, except in classic Zizekian fashion, he essentially argues that his system is his method. So what is Zizek's system and how does it relate to his method? I'm gonna give you a very quick explanation and then we can like go into the details. Essentially, Zizek's interpretive method, namely to go from Lacan to Hegel to philosophy, uh, to cinema, to jokes, to anecdotes, etc., while perhaps appearing to simply a discur appearing to be a discursive style, a presentation and entertainment, is in fact representative of his system. Now, what is his system? Essentially, you could argue that it is a kind of dialectical opening or positing of a systemic inconsistency of reality as such. It's a very complicated way of saying it. Zizek calls it like not an ontology as such, but a kind of semi-ontology. Essentially, what Zizek argues is that it is a system of incompleteness that in Lacanian terms, the only universal is difference, that the only thing structural about Zizek's work is that it is apparently unstructured. Now, that seems like a rhetorical dodge, so let's go one layer deeper than that. Essentially, 
Zizek is stuck between a rock and a hard place, which is after Hegel, we can no longer return to a pre-critical, pre-Kantian ontology. In other words, an ontology that simply accepts the binary, uh, the, the a binary nature of a metaphysics that posits pure form versus illusions in the cave, Plato's famous allegory of the cave. After Kant, we no longer have a pre-critical metaphysics. In other words, we no longer have a quote-unquote naive metaphysical uh, 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 proposition, which is to say that we have the truth outside the cave and illusion in the cave. What happens within Hegel is that, of course, a lot of Kantians accuse Hegel of reverting back to a pre-critical metaphysics. Zizek says nothing could be less true. In fact, Hegel is, for Zizek, the philosopher of openness par excellence, the philosopher of extreme inconsistency par excellence. Hegel is the philosopher who takes the Kantian critical revolution and, in a sense, remains true to it by seemingly betraying it. In other words, by accusing Kant of having not gone not far enough, of having been not radical enough, that Kant's objects in themselves nevertheless seem to uphold a kind of pre-critical ontology from within. Or, as Schopenhauer once joked, that Kant is like a man at a masked ball who spends the entire evening flirting with a woman, only to realize at the end, when he removes her mask, that she has been his wife all along. In other words, Schopenhauer essentially jokes that the Kantian critical philosophy is flirting with the possibility of, of a radical ontological openness, and yet once the mask is removed, remains a pre-critical ont ontology of metaphysical completeness, namely essence versus appearance, or for Kant, the objects in themselves that are barred by reason as such. Now, Zizek said, where, when I said that Zizek is stuck between a rock and a hard place, the rock is therefore that after Hegel, there can be no return to a pre-critical ontological position. However, Zizek is also not a post-metaphysical uh, deconstructionist or post-modernist. He doesn't fall into any of those camps. And so Zizek is stuck between neither wanting to assume and, and realizing and, and, and knowing the impossibility of assuming a pre-critical, pre-Hegelian, pre-Kantian ontological position, in other words, a system of completeness, a system that has as its objective the obtaining of a pure form or truth. But he is also not with the post-metaphysical camp that finds itself in alignment with a kind of deconstructionist, potentially relativist, certainly postmodern reading in which all meanings simply succumb to different discursive formations. In other words, Zizek is stuck between a contemporary postmodern stance, which he rejects, and, and we can talk more about what postmodernism is and what it is not, uh, as certainly it is often a term that is often abused, certainly by its critics, but Zizek is a critic of postmodernism, although in a distinctly postmodern sense, and he is aware and self-conscious enough that he doesn't simply want to return to a pre-critical metaphysical framework which, let's be honest, for some analytic philosophers remains the objective. And this is the situation that Zizek is stuck in. And his way out, essentially, is to hysterically revolve around this problem, to return to this problem itself over and over and over, and to illuminate it from various different vantage points. And what Zizek essentially does is therefore to take one philosopher who is often misin or not even philosopher, an anti-philosopher who is often misinterpreted as being a postmodernist, namely Lacan, and to use Lacanian psychoanalysis, a post-metaphysical anti-philosophical system par excellence, to illuminate those onto open, uh, the ontologically open parts of Hegel. That is Zizek's system. And it's a system that goes all the way back to his very first book that was released, which is based on his PhD thesis, uh, which was called The Sublime Hysteric. And The Sublime Hysteric is how Lacan famously characterizes Hegel. I've explained it elsewhere, but if you're curious, I can give you like a 60 second breakdown of why Lacan calls Hegel the sublime hysteric. So <clears throat> for Lacan, sublimity, the sublime, is anything that is raised to the, from the level from an ordinary object to the level of sublime. So for example, uh, a relic. And with a relic, we take what could be like, I don't know, the bone of somebody's pinky finger, and we put it in a glass case, and we've elevated to the level of the thing. 
And so Lacan's definition of the sublime is the object elevated to the level of the thing. Think about an art gallery. As soon as you put something in an art, art gallery, you've elevated the seemingly ordinary object to the level of the thing. I mean, that's Duchamp's essential argument when it comes to, for example, the, the famous, you know, pissoir. It's not that anything could be art. It's exactly the other way around. It's that only one thing can be art, namely that which is placed in the gallery. This is often misinterpreted. Oh, Duchamp is a relativist who's saying anything can be art. No, no, it's quite the opposite. It's that one thing can be art at the cost of excluding everything else. And this is Lacan's argument also about the sublime. The sublime is the object elevated to the level of the thing. Now, you have half of the proposition for understanding why he argues that Hegel is the most sublime hysteric. So, what is the hysteric for Lacan? The hysteric is the antithesis to the psychotic. The psychotic is the one who unquestioningly engages in his own frame of perception, of reality, who inhabits his illusion or his fantasy completely. There's a great anecdote from Sartre that Zizek mentions that is very Lacanian, uh, where a, uh, a woman receives phone calls from God. And um, at a certain point, actually, I'm <laughs> worried that I'm not going to tell the anecdote correctly. So I'm actually going to go and check the reference. But um, I want to make sure that I know the reference exactly. A woman receives a phone call uh, that, uh, that comes from God. And at a certain point, the, uh, the shrink tells her, yes, okay, yeah, a woman receives phone calls, phone calls from God. And at a certain point, uh, her psychoanalyst tells her, or her shrink tells her, uh, you should, you know that God doesn't exist, right? You know that God can't be calling you. And the woman looks at him completely commonsensically and says, of course I know God doesn't exist. That's what I keep telling him. That is the Lacanian position I propose the psychotic. It's not that she believes fully in God. She doesn't even need the, the, uh, the mechanism of faith. It's simply that God is calling her. She doesn't believe in God, and so she has to tell him that he doesn't exist. Of course, this links back to Lacan's famous uh, maxim apropos the existentialist declaration of the death of God, that they may well have declared the death of God, but they forgot to tell God, as it were. Now, Lacan's position, apropos of the psychotic, therefore, is that the psychotic is the person who is too well or too fully integrated into their subjective, constitutive fantasy, that they cannot step out of it, that even the exception to it becomes part of how it is integrated. Think about the psychotic element, for example, when it comes to people's political beliefs. You'll present them with something that appears to be completely contradictory uh, to their reality or that it undermines directly the factual nature of their reality, and they'll simply find a way to interpret or incorporate the very thing that appears to be an exception to it back into their system of thought. And so what makes psychosis, and I'm not saying that people who like believe in conspiracy theories are psychotics, I'm simply trying to apply the principle. What makes psychosis complete is therefore that the very exceptions to it are folded back into the completeness of it, that there's nothing antithetical to it. The hysteric, on the other hand, is the one who is completely and constantly undermining from within the completeness of his fantasy or illusion. The classic hysterical position anybody can relate to is this. You're in love, you're in a relationship, you've had the perfect day with your partner, you went to the movies, you know, you had coffee together, ice cream, whatever, uh, wonderful conversations, talking about books, going for a walk in the park, uh, you finally found your soulmate, etc. And then at the end of the day, you're lying in bed together and she's sleeping and you think to yourself, is this love? Does she really like me? Do I really like her? This nagging question, is this love? Is this the real thing? Does she really love me? Is the hysterical position par excellence? It's, I have here what is essentially a perfect categorical fantasy of the perfect day, and yet nevertheless I resist complete immersion in it. There's something hysterically, that, uh, that uh, there's a thread of hysteria that I want to, un to, to make it all unravel. It's apologies about the lack of grammar in that sentence. For Lacan, hysteria is the key subjective component. In other words, subjectivity equals hysteria. That the subjective position is precisely this hysterical unraveling from within, this resistance to incorporation into the psychotic completeness. And now you can take those two positions, and apologies, I know this has gone more than 60 seconds, so sidebar. Um, when Lacan argues that Hegel is the 
most sublime hysteric. What he is essentially saying is that Hegel elevates hysteria to the level of the thing, that he takes hysteria and that he makes it sublime. Now, why would Hegel make hysteria sublime? Well, remember, psychotic is full, complete closure of the system. Hysteric is the pulling at the threads of the emergence into the complete system. What does Hegel do? Hegel completely undermines the binary ontological position of truth versus falsehood, of essence versus appearance. In other words, if you think about Kant as being the first philosopher who is the first hysterical philosopher, the first philosopher with his critical metaphysical framework who begins to pick away at what therefore would be the psychotic philosophical position going back to Plato, namely the allegory of the cave, then Hegel would simply be the one who radicalizes Kant, who elevates Kant's hysteria to the level of the thing, who takes it to its most extreme logical conclusion, namely to posit that rather than being antithetical to the completeness of the ontological system, that the only completeness is precisely this incompleteness. Hegel as a radical thinker of ontological openness. That is why Zizek uses Lacan to argue that Hegel is the most sublime hysteric. That the pre-critical metaphysical framework is psychotic. It is fully immersed in the metaphysical boundary or, or uh, the binary of essence versus appearance. And that Kant is the first hysteric in philosophy, if you will, who undermines it and yet who remains nevertheless attached to the pre-critical metaphysical framework. And that Hegel is the one who elevates Kant's hysteria to the level of the sublime, as it were. And now you can see why Zizek would be patently against the characterization of Hegel as being a, as a, being a pre critical metaphysical mysticist who cannot cope with the Kantian revolution and therefore has to return to a kind of completeness of the absolute. Instead, Zizek sees Hegel as a continuation of Kant, who radicalizes Kant, who elevates Kant's hysteria philosophically to the level of the thing in Lacanian terms and therefore is able to posit an absoluteness of incompleteness as well. In other words, an ontological system that is no longer complete, but that has as its defining characteristic, its perpetual never-ending incompleteness. Hence also why, and I want to explain this here, but hence why Zizek uses the Lacanian concept of the real to infuse this argument apropos Hegelian metaphysics. Now, if you followed my argument thus far, I, and I really hope you have, <clears throat> although I understand it is difficult, then you will see why Zizek, the accusation, what is wrong with Zizek is that he doesn't have a system, he only has an interpretive method, has to be turned on its head. Namely, Zizek's interpretive method is his system in disguise. <clears throat> that this, if you will, hysterical, frenetic jumping around from position to position is itself the exemplary characteristic of his system. Namely, what Zizek does, to put it very simply, is Zizek takes hysteria, which, as I've just indicated, is in fact a key component of his ontological proposition of Rappo Hegel, he takes hysteria and he elevates it into a philosophical method which reveals in its form, but not in its content, its own system. I know that sounds complicated, but it's actually a fairly simple proposition, which is that the difference between form and content is form is the manner in which something is expressed. Content is that which it contains from within. Now, the traditional definition of the critique of ideology is that it is not about the form, but that it is about the hidden content in the form itself. So no longer the binary between content and form, but instead the hidden content in the form. Now go all the way back to Platonic metaphysics. The allegory of the cave is a proposition that says the content lies outside the form of illusion. The Kantian position is simply to say that the form itself contains the content, namely the antinomies, that reason is itself the barrier to that which it seeks to find beyond the veil of reason. The Hegelian Lacanian move is simply to transpose this ontological void, namely truth that lies beyond human cognition, back into its own condition of impossibility itself, namely into the veil, into reason, into subjectivity. Hegel's the true is the whole or subject equals substance is therefore this radical ontology of incompleteness. How the unknown substance that lies beyond human cognition falls back into that which was perceived to be its barrier in the first place. In other words, 
to put it in Zizek's terms, the uh, ontological conditions of impossibility thereby be pre become precisely the conditions of possibility. And so when Zizek teaches, the form of his teaching mirrors the ontological proposition, which is its content. Namely, that it is not about bringing it back down to a binary system in which there is an exposition of what is true and what is false, but that this in seeming inconsistency is precisely the methodological system in disguise. Now, I want to briefly say, if this has all seemed hugely abstract and confusing, please keep in mind that this is the final lecture in a lecture series that I've been hosting. So I'm assuming some uh, previous familiarity with his expositions here. I am, however, trying in my own way to lay this out as clearly as possible. So thank you if you're still with me. So that is the first accusation of what is wrong with Zizek, that he is a, uh, an illegitimate philosopher because he does not propose any system. He simply has an interpretive method of reading. And the argument that I've made, that you also find in Zizek, is that Zizek's interpretive method is his system, and it is a system that is trying to solve the problem, or perhaps reframe the problem, of what it means to be stuck in the impossibility of returning to a pre-critical, pre-Kantian philosophical position, or a system, versus the unwillingness to engage in a purely um, a deconstructionist or postmodern embrace of method over system. And so, in a very meta way, Zizek rejects the binary of system versus method, namely the emphasis on system being a pre-Kantian preoccupation, and the emphasis on interpretive method being a post-metaphysical preoccupation, a distinctly modern one, and argues that his method is his system. That is the response. Now, let's move to the second criticism a propos Zizek. What is wrong with Zizek? Which is usually characterized as um, he, he's a fraud who, uh, let's say, entertains because he lacks any kind of consistent contribution to philosophy and that his myriad uh, ticks, the pulling at the shirt, the sniffing, etc., are... Uh, uh, signs that are being sent subconsciously to reveal the fact that he knows he is a fraud, etc., that, that he is a charlatan. Now, of course, these are ad hominem attacks in the extreme, uh, and I think everybody, anybody will be able to detect that. But it is kind of interesting to see how Zizek himself responds to uh, his awareness of his tics, his physical outward uh, uh, tics that he is aware of. Now, one of the things that Zizek has argued also in the book, The Inconstant of the Void, he says, there's nothing hidden beneath his tics. In fact, from a Freudian position, this is exactly the entire argument about the unconscious versus the subconscious. The subconscious always posited that the self was like an iceberg and that we see the tip of the iceberg, but underneath the water, there's the entire, the magnitude of the thing submerged. And of course, this is an ideological supplement to the Victorian notion of the gentleman, the person who represses his inner urges and becomes the elevated figure of civilization and enlightenment. Of course, again, this contributes ideologically to the quote-unquote legitimization of extreme exploitation and racism around the world through colonialism, because now this enlightened figure of self-control has the task of bringing the same civilizational uh, uh, prowess to the unenlightened savage worlds, etc., uh, and, and, and takes them from their savagery into their enlightened selves. Here you can see how this narrative about the subconscious becomes an ideological supplement that legitimizes extreme violence apropos uh, 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 globally exploited populations. But further than that, the juxtaposition subconscious versus unconscious is the Freudian insight is much more radical. The Freudian insight is to say there is nothing underneath the surface. What is repressed is the fact that there is nothing to be repressed. That's essentially the position. The unconscious is therefore not the repression of some primordial urge or trip. Uh, trip usually being a... Uh, actually, I'll get to drive in a moment. The subconscious 
posits that there is something to be repressed. The unconscious posits that what is repressed is precisely that there is nothing to be repressed. This is, of course, a much darker, more important thing. And even think on it like political levels, like the, the, the greatest political conspiracies are never to cover up that which has been done. It's always to cover up the fact that nothing has been done. That is the argument that Freud essentially makes with the unconscious. The true conspiracy of human subjectivity is not to cover up all the bad things that lie underneath. It's to cover up that there is nothing underneath save for the repression itself. That repression is a constitutive negativity. That subjectivity is therefore not what lies beyond the barrier of one's subconscious and is the sort of the triumph of having successfully repressed the urges of the subconscious. Subjectivity is nothing but this retroactive mirage that is created by repression itself. It's a much more radical argument. Now, I'll return in a moment to this, but Zizek, of course, argues that we can make the same argument apropos Marx, that Marx's interpretive method is similar to uh, Freud's method apropos dreams, but I'll explain that in a moment. And so Zizek says when it comes to his tics, his outward manifestations of what appear to be discomfort, he says there's nothing underneath. There's, it would be completely wrong to assume that they are the manifestation, the symptomatic betrayal of some kind of underlying uh, discomfort. Instead, Juzik says they are simply mechanical, biological, uh, 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 um, if you will. Uh, uh, well, I don't know the exact word that he uses. I want to make sure he uses it. You'd have to go back to the unconscious of the white to see the exact word he uses, the word that he uses. But he essentially says that they're purely biological, mechanical, um, um, if like not symptoms, but urges, essentially. I don't know what the clinical word would be. In other words, that they don't betray some kind of underlying secret, but that they are what they are, which is my brain computing in a certain way in situations that make me uncomfortable, which is to speak in public. Um, and so what's interesting here is that Zizek's argument, apropos his tics, isn't simply to deflect them, but actually to make a philosophical and psychoanalytic argument. Because in the same way that he says, my critics believe that there's something underneath, he says this is the central position between the subconscious and the unconscious. Now, in the word unconscious, we can actually see the same mechanism that Zizek talks about in terms of infinite judgment when it comes to the undead. So one of Zizek's classic takes on zombies that combines pop culture zombies uh, with uh, the, the Kantian infinite judgment is that he essentially says that Kant's proposition about the infinite judgment or indefinite judgment, sorry, indefinite judgment Excuse me, I'm going too fast. Kant's proposition about indefinite judgment is that instead of having something which uh, uh, has the affirmation of a predicate, for example, something is alive, or the negation of a predicate, something is not alive, sort of the classic metaphysical linguistic structure, instead, an indefinite judgment is something which is the affirmation of a non-predicate. So not the affirmation of a predicate, it is alive, nor the negation of a predicate, but the affirmation of a non-predicate. And for Zizek, the perfect example of the affirmation of a non-predicate is the figure of the zombie, the undead. In fact, un is for Zizek precisely the linguistic signifier of the affirmation of a non-predicate. Think about the classic German word, which of course Freud deals with in the uncanny or unheimlich. Namely, not something which is a, a, a of the home or not of the home or comforting or not comforting, but something which is uncanny by definition of existing in between. When we talk, for example, about uncanny valley when it comes to animation, it's not that it is completely convincingly real, nor that it is completely fake. It is that it exists on a kind of pole in between real and fakeness. And this indeterminate nature of being on neither side, of suspended in between two poles, is for Zizek uh, uh, the affirmation of a non-predicate, or, if you will, Kant's indefinite judgment. And for those of you who are familiar with, with Zizek's uh, famous quote-unquote maxim, which he takes from uh, Bartleby's The Scrivener, namely, I would prefer not to, Zizek here finds an entire ethical system within the affirmation of a non-predicate. Namely, specifically not, I don't want to do it, but... I would prefer not to do it, namely to affirm a non-predicate. And for Zizek, this is the revolutionary argument as well, that a revolution is never simply the positing of an antithesis to something, but the emergence of a moment that is not yet symbolically 
if you will, uh, overdetermined, that has not yet found its master signifier, that exists suspended, as it were, and that the revolutionary nature, therefore, is not that it is antithetical to the given order. In fact, the given order usually simply cannibalizes the idea of resistance to it. Think about Che Guevara t-shirts, for example. Instead, the revolutionary potential is precisely in this indeterminate feature, that a revolution is the emergence of the uncanny, of the not yet symbolically completely signified place or event, in Bajé's terms, within the given order as such, which necessarily has to emerge out of its contradictions. Hence why it's so important to note that the revolution isn't simply, I am against this and I'm raising up arms against it. It's not advocating for better wages. It's the necessary structural incompleteness that is papered over by means of ideological obfuscation, for example, within the current given ideological order, which is capitalism, that finds itself in a kind of symptomatic, excessive, non-symbolically overdetermined moment of radical incompleteness, which is a crazily abstract way of saying that Zizek argues that every affirmation of a predicate doesn't just succumb to the negation of a predicate, but has to have this third excessive category. And this third excessive category, which cannot be filled in as of yet, is the revolutionary category of indefinite judgment, of I would prefer not to, of the zombie. And now you can link that argument back to the Freudian unconscious. <clears throat> Remember, I said that the subconscious is something has to be repressed. The unconscious is what has to be repressed is that there is nothing to be repressed. In other words, that there's an ontological incompleteness, or, if you will, a completeness of incompleteness. Hence, subjectivity equals symptomatic or symptomatic behavior, that all subjectivity equals repression. Subjectivity is not what emerges after successful repression. Subjectivity is repression in disguise. And now you can see how the unconscious would therefore also be a philosophical argument about the nature of indeterminate judgment. It's not simply we have self versus non-self, true self versus false self, the successfully repressed uh, individual versus the inner, you know, libidinal excess of the subconscious. But instead that subject is nothing other, nothing less, if you will, than this repression rendered back to itself in its opposite form. Subjectivity equals successful repression, essentially. And so this un, this category of incompleteness, is the central precondition of subjectivity, at least it would be for Lacan. And so the argument that is made against Zizek, which is to say that Zizek is a, um, you know, someone whose tics betray the fact that he's a charlatan who's ill at ease with himself and that he has nothing to say, Zizek uses this as a way to make a philosophical argument. Now, of course, if you follow the previous position where I started, <clears throat> you'll find that this all leads back to an ontological position, namely, Hegel's ontology, in Zizek's Lacanian retelling of it, is therefore this un, this indefinite judgment. Namely, if Hegel's ontology is an ontology of incompleteness, of a radical openness, then it is precisely, once again, to say that Hegel's ontology is an un-ontology, which is a horrible word. Don't coin that as any kind of concept. But the mechanism functions the same, which is to say, if we have the affirmation of a predicate and the uh, negation of a predicate, namely something is live or it is not alive. Here we would have the same classic binary within a metaphysical pre-critical framework, namely something is essence outside the cave, pure form, or it is illusion, subjective fantasy inside the cave, namely affirmation of truth, negation of truth, pure form versus impure form. Now you can see how Kant actually upholds this idea of the impure form by means of the idea of the antinomy. Hegel simply radicalizes this by saying, what if it's not simply the affirmation of a predicate and the negation of a predicate? What if it is the affirmation of a non-predicate? And what would the metaphysical affirmation of a non-predicate be? Well, it would be the dialectic. It would be the unity of opposites. It would be the truth, the whole, or substance equals subject. It would be the fall of that which there was not... It's, it's, let me put it like this. The ontological position is this. Namely, what is... It is not that we have a fall from pure form. It is that pure form retroactively emerges through the fall itself. In the same way that for the unconscious, there is no original substance to be repressed antithetically by the conscious being, it's that retroactively, the essence of subjectivity lies within the repression of the fact that there is nothing to be repressed. That's the ontological argument that Hegel makes. 
that's not the essence that falls into subjectivity. It's that there was no essence to begin with, that the only essence lies within the fall from that which was, there, was not to be fallen from in the first place. This is constitutive negativity. This is the incontinence of the void. This is the hysterical spiraling of substance around its own apparent negation. This is the uncanny element within Hegel. This is the affirmation of a non-predicate within Zizek's philosophical system reified as method. That's his argument, essentially. I really, I know this sounds incredibly abstract, but there's no, for me at least, no clearer way of putting this. Now, this leads me to the final criticism as to what is wrong with Zizek. <clears throat> which is the one that now you will perhaps be able to answer yourself, because you should understand how ridiculous this claim is. Namely, that Zizek fails to be a proper philosopher because he doesn't have his own doctrine of thought, something that Jordan Peterson, for example, raised apropos Zizek in the debate between Zizek and Peterson. Peterson said, somewhat uh, patronizingly, somewhat pedantically, you are such a gifted philosopher, you're such a gifted communicator, you have such an uh, uh, admiring audience, etc., which already reveals to my mind Peterson's preoccupations, which is, you know, how can you accumulate an audience, etc. If you have such a big audience, and if you have so much influence, why is it that you fail to articulate your own doctrine or theory? Why is it that you hold on to other people's ideas? Which is another way of saying something that I see online all the time, which, uh, regrettably, I, I have to admit, is also uh, uh, said to me a lot, which is, you're clearly not an original thinker because you're only articulating other people's positions, which is a somewhat infuriating <laughs> accusation because, to my mind, the people who claim to be articulating original positions, you know, 10 rules for life or whatever, are the ones who are most fraudulent to claim that you are detached from any philosophical tradition, that your work has no bearing upon age-old philosophical questions that are deeply engaged in an almost life-or-death stakes way with previous contributions to human thought, is to simply, in my mind, admit that you are serving one god, and the god that you are serving is the market, that you are simply facilitating a book that, or a system of ideas that will, you know, find their way into people's pain points and make them feel temporarily better, which by God is probably a wonderful thing, but is antithetical to what philosophy really is, at least to my mind, which is an engagement with the tradition of philosophy and the manner in which philosophy is in constant negotiation with itself. And the accusation I propose Zizek is therefore, what's wrong with Zizek is that he is not a real master, but that he is a hysteric who has no idea what he's talking about. And the funny thing is that, and Zizek's reply is very clear on this, after Hegel, there can be no master in philosophy. The whole point of Hegelian metaphysics is to argue against the idea of the philosopher king, the one who exits the cave and teaches the others how to exit as well. In fact, contemporary sophists are precisely those people who are positing as the master and telling other people to wake up. Hence also why Zizek's argument is that, applied to ideology, is that the most ideological position is to advocate to wake up from ideology, to exit from ideology, to take whatever pill you want to take. That the Hegelian position is that you can't exit ideology, that whenever we're presented with what appears to be a binary framing mechanism, a choice to exit the cave or remain in the cave, we should insist on a third option. It's also why Zizek says, apropos the matrix, when you're presented with a blue pill and the red pill, you should always ask for a third pill, a third Hegelian pill. And now if you understand Hegel's ontology a little bit better, you'll understand why Zizek insists on this third option. Hegel, when presented with the Kantian, supposedly critical framework of metaphysics, which is to say, uh, that, actually, let me take a step back. The pre-critical frame of metaphysics is to say we have truth versus illusion. You can take two pills. You can wake up by exiting the cave, or you can remain in the cave. Blue pill, red pill. Kant's critical metaphysical framework is to say, aha, this is a false choice. After all, you cannot really choose to exit uh, subjective reality into truth, 
because the very choice presented to you is already mediated or framed through subjective reality, namely through reason, conceptualized. Hegel then makes the more radical argument, which is to say it's not that the choice is false. Is that the falsity of the choice implies that there has to be a third choice. The choice which retroactively undermines the pre-critical framework of the choice itself, the third pill, the third Hegelian pill. And so Zizek says that anybody who promises to uh, w teach you how to wake up from ideology is simply echoing in a sophistical form the classic uh, 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 platonic pre-critical framework that you could exit the cave or step outside of subjective illusion. Again, Zizek is drawing upon Hegel, uh, upon Lacan here, because Lacan's argument is that reality can only act be accessed through fantasy. That, and here you can see that it's a psychoanalytic reworking of the classic metaphysical proposition. Essence versus appearance simply becomes fantasy, uh, uh, reality versus fantasy. Lacan says that we access reality only through fantasy. That the goal is therefore not to extricate yourself from fantasy in order to access reality. It's almost the other way around. If you extricated fantasy, reality itself would crumble, and that therefore you have to be the master of your fantasy so as to properly access reality. And the entire position for Zizek of being the master figure who teaches you how to wake up or how to transform your life, or even in metaphysical terms, how to become the philosopher king and exit the cave, is no longer possible after Hegel. In fact, to argue that you are a master handing out wisdom and rules for life and how to live is itself a kind of admi admitting of defeat, that you have failed to fully internalize the Hegelian revolution in thought. And of course, on a sidebar, we could also argue that philosophy, there's a great anecdote here from um, Alain Badieu. Alain Badieu has written two manifestos for philosophy. Philosophy, uh, manifesto number one, philosophy is dead. What's wrong with the world is that philosophy is dying out. No one's interested in philosophy. It's terrible. We're all doomed. Manifesto number two starts by saying, actually, it's even worse than that. It's that no one cares about philosophy because everybody has gotten into philosophy. In other words, the philosophy of cats, the philosophy of motorcycling, the philosophy of coffee. The philosophy has become universalized into its seeming opposite. And so Badiou says, yes, we're still doomed. It's still that philosophy is disappearing, but it's not that it's simply making it an exit from the stage. It's that now everything is philosophy. Everything has to be the philosophy of. And this is essentially also Zizek's argument. Zizek's argument is that philosophy, as soon as it becomes, I am the master who is handing down wisdom to you to create actionable insights into your life has thereby already betrayed its originary cause, which is precisely to inhabit the gaps, the, cra the, gaps, the cracks, the symbolic emptiness, the, the places in which there's an undetermined reality as of yet. And these cracks or glitches are everywhere and can be thought from within. That, for Zizek, is the task of the philosopher, not to take these gaps and stitch them back into a kind of pseudo-analytically comforting uh, uh, master framework that you can then use to Improv uh, improve your life, etc. Ironically, also for Zizek, this doesn't really improve your life. The best way to improve your life is precisely to engage in this critical way with philosophy and art and theory and movies and politics, which I certainly would advocate as well. Now, this leads us to the final point of this lecture, <clears throat> which is to say, why is Zizek still worth taking seriously? And this is where I would uh, venture a little theory of my own. As you know, these lectures have been preoccupied with Zizek's theory. Um, not as some people have claimed, because I am a card-carrying Zizekian who believes that Zizek is my philosopher of choice who I will weaponize against others, which actually betrays very poor understanding of how I view philosophy. Instead, the reason that I think Zizek is still worth taking seriously is because <clears throat> Zizek remains an incredibly good entry point into so many other philosophical thinkers that Zizek is, to my mind, one of the few thinkers who posits a return that isn't reactionary, which is to say, let's return to the problems in Hegel that remain nevertheless unresolved, fruitfully, hysterically until today. Think about it. The true revolutions in art and in modernism, to my mind, are always the ones that remain inscrutable 
Like, as much as I love, like, Brecht, for example, as soon as Brecht becomes performed on the London stage, and, and something that, you know, av like, like uh, uh, wealthy Londoners enjoy going to, some element of Brecht has already been lost. Whereas it's precisely those thinkers that remain radically, inscrutably, in almost impossible for us to ga engage with. Those are the ones that are so interesting. Hegel, Hegel still has this, I don't know what you would call it, like halo around him of being this either mystical, inscrutable, abstract, crazy thinker, or being a communist, for example. That we keep going back to these figures that we cannot fully seem to wrestle out one determinate truth position from. And this is precisely what it means to be a great philosopher. A great philosopher is never somebody who makes things more clear, who hands out easy, you know, recipes for how to make sense of the chaos of the world. The great philosophers are the ones who put their finger on the chaos, who give us a way of thinking the chaos. Now, secondly, those of you who have followed my lectures for a little bit longer will know that my original quote-unquote love in philosophy and theory is not for Zizek's work, but for Frederick Jameson's work. Frederick Jameson being a, a, a Marxist literary theorist and also a very well-known postmodernist thinker or thinker of the postmodern might be more accurate. Now, Frederick Jameson has two things that are really important to his thought. One, what you might call a dialectical method. Frederick Jameson essentially posits that the purpose of philosophy and of education is pr primarily educational. And in his education, it should never be about the direct relaying of information to somebody. It should be about teaching them how to make connections of their own, to give people the tools and to model for them the passion and the intellectual curiosity required to start making connections between things. And what's crucial here is it's not simply the cultural studies affectation that there is philosophy in everything. There's philosophy of the Beatles and philosophy of Tarantino, etc. But precisely to say that it is the other way around, that within contemporary culture, we can find all the symptoms of what is being societally repressed. As Gramsci famously said it, we have all the morbid symptoms that emerge when the old is dying and the new has not yet been born. And that therefore an engagement with quote unquote popular culture or to be completely contemporary isn't simply a play to be relevant, but instead to do the fundamental philosophical thing, which is to think what could only be thought in this present moment. Hegel could not think 2023, nor would he predict it. Marx could not think 2023, nor would he be able to predict it. Only you can think it. And dialectical teaching as a method is thereby meant to imply not only the dialectical unfolding of reality, how we're playing a constant catch-up game, as Hegel put it famously, that the owl of Minerva takes flight only at dusk, but that this is the objective of any philosophically inclined person. This is the mission, the project, to think that which could not be thought before in a manner that engages with all that has been thought before. And this creates intellectual curiosity and excitement. It makes the world more rich. It's something that has revolutionary potential because you cannot do it alone. You have to do it with others. You have to converse and discuss and write and teach and read and write and let yourself be consumed by this flame, which is the philosophical flame of passionate engagement. That is my belief. And to my mind, Zizek, in his refusal to be the master, in his refusal to be the academic professor who has an expertise area in Hegel, who refuses to comply to those things and accepts that he will be radically misunderstood is someone who allows other people to follow that path and to set them free. And that has been my purpose here. My purpose in starting this project two and a half years ago was never to be the authority on anything. It was never to be the Zizek whisperer or the Zizek apologist. It was always meant to inflame your mind with enthusiasm for philosophy and thought and writing and thinking and conversing and teaching and above all, reading. That has been my goal here from day one, 
was to inspire you to do the same. And it's painful to me how often people want me to be, quote unquote, the master. Or if I refuse to be the master, they'll be angry with me for failing to be one successfully. And this, to my mind, is the task of philosophy today, to refuse to be the master, to refuse to propose any kind of metaphysical system that posits a return to a pre-critical framework. And finally, and this is where I differ from Zizek, to be a philosopher is to engage with others, is to be online, is to think with people and to teach and to educate and enrich and to make yourself part of that, which is not always easy. I don't like to editorialize, but my dream in life is not to be on the internet. <clears throat> I don't like being on camera. I certainly don't like everybody having an opinion on what I do, but I believe that this project, if it enthuses you and convinces you to go to the theater or the movies or to read or to write, to understand that to be alive isn't simply to be the passive recipient of everything that's happening, to feel like you are an active, engaged person. If I can convince you that you are that already, then I feel like I've done something. And that's why I refuse to dumb down these classes into content. I refuse to turn them into rules of life. I patently refuse to submit and bow down to the incentive structures of the algorithm and the, I don't know, publishing industry or whatever. That is my dream, to insist that this can be something that is allowed to exist. And so thank you guys. I just wanna say thank you. This is the end of this lecture series, The Divine Madness, Zizek on Christianity. I've enjoyed it so much. I'm in Seattle, Washington. I'm having a wonderful time going to all the bookstores here. Um, please do consider, if you'd like to watch these lectures, going back, they're all open access, they're all free. I will never charge for these classes. They will never be paywalled. They will never be part of a master course. You can have all of these for free because you guys give me so much by allowing me to be a part of this community as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you'd like to download my ebook, you can find that on Patreon. Thank you guys, and I will see you next week. All right, that's Instagram gone. Um, thank you everybody here on YouTube. I do have a Patreon. It is www.patreon.com forward slash Julian Philosophy. And uh, thank you to the patrons who continue to contribute financially to this project. It is so incredibly wonderful and enriching. And I want to keep doing this forever. So thank you guys.